to welcome everybody to our uh, committee of the whole meeting of the Carson Town Council. And welcome to the uh, welcome to the uh, audience watching on TV land. We'll uh, have an opening prayer with by uh, Mayor Cronin and then we'll go from there. Dear Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful to be here as council for the town of Kelston and to be able to discuss different issues and to be able to listen to various presentations that might be of interest to us all. Father, we pray that uh, we might be able to find solutions to difficulties that we may encounter or to find resources that are needed to push projects forwards and we pray for understanding and be able to come to mutual agreement and this we pray humbly in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So we'll call the meeting to order and uh, welcome our delegations and uh, people in the gallery. Glad to have you all here. Welcome to our media from the Temple City Star, Bill and Corey, who it's not his birthday today, it's his brother's. <laughs> and are you rich or okay, yes, welcome it's Rich, rich Sloan. Yes. Yeah, have you here. So um Do you want to excuse us? Pardon me? Can you excuse? excuse oh yes. Us. Yes. Uh Councillor Drew is uh going to be here presently. He probably gonna be fifteen or twenty minutes before he gets here and Councillor Self won't be here so we'll excuse them at this time. So um do we want to go ahead with the additions to and adoption of the agenda before we do our business? Councilor Bangry, you have something? Yes, I'd like to talk about AUMA, the contents. We put it under questions. Okay, AUMA. Councilor Bangry. Okay. Any other additions to the meeting? Okay. <coughs> Seeing none. Like someone to adopt the agenda? Councilor Court? All in favor? Hearing. Okay, our first delegation will be uh, representatives from our Mayor's Youth Council. We're just getting things set up here, Councilor. You're getting things set up? Yeah. Where do you want me to go with this? You're good. Uh, Rich can sing for us. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a good singer. <laughs> I was supposed to have another guy, but I think he was confused with 5.30 and 5. He kept asking me all throughout the day, so. <laughs> but it's okay. In my area. I'll just wait for this. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm just here on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the yeah. good council, and then when this is all ready to go, we can so, go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is my second year on the Mayor's Youth Council. I was in grade 11, and now this year, my senior year, I'm in grade 12. Uh, the president of the high school there, and graduating pretty quick here within a few weeks, and I'm going on a mission shortly afterwards to handle the gas to Chile. So, yeah, that's yeah. what my plans are. Um, been a great opportunity to work with Mayor Cronin and actually uh, Shaw, uh, <coughs> yeah, Jeff, Jeff, <laughs> I know his brother Shaw, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, Jeff, um, so just we, through the years we've just talked about a lot of, yeah, there it is, um, what will help our youth in the community. And I think that's that's great that the mayor takes time out of her busy, busy schedule to come and visit with us every lunch period, every month. So. All right, Rich, is that what you're going here? It's, there, it'll have to be centered there. Well, it was. Should have brought your dad, Rich, apparently. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just leave it there. Okay. Let me see if it's moving. Yeah. Turn off the light here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of my introduction to what we we're doing. So here's a, what we've kind of discussed this year is this, learning the fundamentals of local government and the leadership that goes behind that. And another thing we learned a lot is how local government impacts us through a variety of different ways. Uh, they at the beginning of each year they give us a kind of a binder full of. Uh, bills and 
laws and acts and so forth and maintenance stuff that the town takes care of, which is great to look over just to find out where and the budget of the town and all that kind of stuff. Um, discuss what could better the community for the youth a lot. I think that was the main focus of what we did at for Mayor's Youth Council and some possible implementations of new things for our parks and green space. Towards the end, we talked a lot about that. So we'll just kind of go through them each, each, each one by one, just sort of a little slideshow here. Um, so what we learned about in like the, the leaders, especially Mayor Maggie Cronin, um, is like our leaders try to find ways to make the community standard of living better. And absolutely, I agree with Mayor Cronin always going around, especially just taking time to come visit us at the schedule just to see what we need in the community, what the youth want. That's just great. Um, we talked a lot about taxes actually with Jeff here, um, and just to find a happy medium in the taxes and how the town does that, and enough to pay for public industries and all that kind of jazz. And then, but like not too much to, so you guys can still get elected here. <laughs> right? Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we talked about quite a bit. Um, and it was uh, the last meeting we talked about uh, how we do that we had and we went over them and there was a lot. <laughs> um, just I guess the tax people how we went about that. And the different tax brackets for the community went over just kind of like what I was saying about the, the assessment on houses, you know, if your house is a lot nicer and newer and bigger, uh, you're of course gonna be taxed a little more than the you have a small house that's old run down and it's not worth as much. So uh, we learned about that. Um, and learning the budgeting of the, all the money goes. Um, they brought in a spreadsheet for us where they had laid out everything, uh, schools, sewer, all that kind of stuff, and where our money goes to and how they planned ahead for the future up to, I think, one on our sheet was 2022, I think. So, yeah, that was very interesting to see that how it's all distributed and what takes up lots of the taxes and the town's money and what doesn't take as much and what maybe could take more and stuff like that. So it was, that was very good. Um, and then finally, like, what we mostly focused on is how to better community for the youth. Um, I think a lot we talked about what impl implications we can put in for youth. Like, uh, at first we talked about lots of renovations for place and I'll get into that. And uh, just like parks, what to do with parks and green space, and we'll get more into that. Um, just like that second slide, then, like we talked a lot about that. Uh, I mean, my second bullet, um, just what to do with our parks and green space. Like I, we have a lot of it, and it's very nice that we do, and I like that a lot about this town. But I feel like we talked a lot about how we could implement new new things for the community there that probably wouldn't have a lot of cost, but that could benefit this the could benefit the community substantially. So that was that was good, especially for you. Um, we talked about how to maintain sites for youth. Um, one thing that we were kind of talking about was old, um, open counselor group. Uh, <laughs> um, one thing we talked about is, uh, just, just an example, the skate park. So we talked about how, well, okay, there's a skate park and how we would love a new, another one. And lots of the kids, and we have kids talk about that all the time. But then we, we think, okay, what was wrong with our last skate park that didn't go well? And we talked talked about that. And I think we came up with a little list I kind of just kept in my head. Um, one thing, it was um, how access accessible was it? Was it hidden? Was it, where was it? Like, could people find you there? Like. Like stuff like that, and I think that was the problem with that. It was kind of hidden behind the pool, and and, and another thing, it was in a low lit area, um, and it wasn't maintained very well. 
Um, I think if you're going to spend the money on something, you might as well just maintain it for the community to keep it at that point. And that was the thing, like with the skate park that we talked about, it wasn't lit well. Um, it wasn't maintained at all, really. Um, it could have used a lot of new things, and it was it was it was hidden in the dark, and that's why I think what brought a lot of the 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 things that happened there to it. That's why I think it's better gone now than it was because it wasn't doing the community good, really. Um, but I think if we we could change that quite a bit, and I think we we talked a lot of that, we touched on that quite a bit. Um, and other facilities we could use, and, we'll, um, and if they needed renovations or improvements. I always talk a lot about the ice rink and how it is getting fairly old, and what we could do with that, with with the renovation to it, or even just improvements, modifying it quite a bit. Um, I think they're great opportunities. With uh, oh, here's my plug. My friend. Let's get to the good part. Um, <laughs> and just like. What like exactly what I was saying? The ice rink, um, how how we could benefit just from like just better stuff, and how people it would be more accessible, and people could use it more, and for for a variety of things, not just skating, but if you know you can make improvements to it, that could benefit a lot of other things. And uh, another thing I did I didn't put in there was uh, finding times and spaces like for things that we already have, like we talked about with ice rink again. How there's times through the winter when it's just kind of sitting there. There's not a lot. We talked about an open rec league just for high school kids and youth that want to come in and just play hockey because we know the majority of the town that in the winter time plays basketball, sports, other sports. They're not really focusing on the hockey in person. Let's be honest. And um, but I I know for a fact that all my friends would love to go like later at night after we're done basketball after we've done whatever. I'm sure kind of when you you're busy during the day with yeah, lots of stuff. Yeah, but in the evening it's yeah, usually a lot more free. Yeah, exactly. And I think like from like a 9 to 10 we used to do it. We used to rent the ice rink and we used to have a little rec hockey league and just like something like that where they could, you know, that just set a time aside and for that hour and use it. And um, a mother skate, we talked about that, I think, throughout the day, just the daytime where parents could go down with their young kids when they're not in school yet, and they could use that. Um, the next one, we have that link to the mine. Uh, oh, can you click on that? No. You just go scroll down just a little bit. Oh, maybe I don't know. Uh, yeah, just I can. Yeah, okay. So that's a map that we created at the town level, the structure, the skeleton, and the youth populated it. If you just go down a little bit out, yeah, right there, that's, that's good. Um, so this is a website that the town has on their um, website. website. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm kind of right here. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen it, maybe not, but uh, this is this this is one of the three, and this is what to do, ideas that the community have that anyone in the community can go and touch on, and add their own ideas to what they might want to do with our green spaces and stuff. And uh, as you can see, all around there's a there's a dog park, there's um, climbing rock, there's a playground at the top, kind of a parkour, different kind of a thing for. Youth and there's a uh, can't really read that one otherwise. That one's a winter ice like biking track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. A groomed fat bike trail in the winter. Um, and I think there's actually a lot of good ideas that came from it. There was one that's about how our playgrounds don't really have things for children with uh, um, special yeah. needs, and that they could add. A little bit of that, yeah. It's kind of that left corner there, and how there's. In, I don't think any of our playgrounds here in Carson. I know there is in Lethbridge, and I think there's a few in Raymond actually that they have certain um, what I call toys per park sets equipment. equipment. Yeah, that's a better one. Uh, equipment just set aside for kids with special needs, just to, to so I it would help mothers a lot. I feel like just being able to. to take with their other kids, even if they have a special needs kid that can go down there and 
help a lot with that. That that's the parkour, I think. Yeah. Hurt thing that people someone put on there. So uh, yeah, that's that's that was lots of the stuff on there. And they talked about basketball courts and just because a, a lot of the kids have to play basketball in Carson because that's kind of what we grow up around. But I mean, there's lots of kids that don't, and I think we don't really need to focus on that first. But I think a basketball court would be great that was not falling apart, like the one by the elementary. And I think that, and the fixing up of the beach volleyball courts, there's just lots of things that uh, once you would fix them and put in the right equipment and stuff, it might uh, Cost you a little more, but in the long run, that's what's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna benefit from it more or less because you won't have to replace it, and if you keep it well lit, you know, bad things are gonna happen there. You won't have to worry about stuff happening there. And that's what we got. Any questions or? So there is two other slides. One has to do with the swimming pool area. The other one with the ice rink area. Yeah. Same kind of idea. Yes. So it's populated by the youth at this time, and we love to have the, the citizens add their own ideas. You can add links to websites, and uh, the idea is at the end is that all what they have created there for us will be taken in consideration when we establish uh, the. Uh, Rec, park and rec uh, master plan for years to come. So it will allow us to have the proper ideas from a youth perspective of what could be improved in the design of future capital expenditure in town in parks and rec. So there's a couple of things that uh, I just wanted to kind of point out in your um, presentation up there, you, you mentioned in there taxing the people. We don't tax people, we tax the property. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, yes. if we tax the people, we could make some pretty decent money. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's. Welcome, Cam. Howdy. Good to have you here. Welcome, come to the group. One other thing, um, uh, just so our audience that are watching on TV so that they understand. Uh, you were talking about the taxes, and the taxes uh, are, are tied to the assessment, and it doesn't always mean that your taxes are going to stay static yeah, or go down. Yeah, we talked about that. that. They may go yeah. up, but it has nothing to do with, the, at this time, this year, we didn't raise our yeah. taxes. Yes. Our assessment, the assessment went up, yeah. And, yeah. and that affected the tax rate. Yeah, we yeah we saw that on the graph that the town puts yeah. up. The value of the home goes up, and the tax rate stays right. the same. But since but your value of your exactly. home went up, yeah. and that's tax more. Yeah. Well, like not more, but and and I find it a little bit of a little disconcerting for me. I'm a I'm a, I'm a real estate broker, have been for 23 years now, and uh, I look at the properties all the time. I see the fluctuations, the ups and the downs, and the valleys and the mountains in real estate. And right, right now I see property values going down as opposed to the assessors said they're going up. <laughs> and I've had questions with them because I know that where my sales are going and I discussed with the other realtors and property values in real terms of, of, of purchases, the properties aren't going up. And, but for some reason the, the pro provincial assessors have said that they're going up. And okay. the mayor's got to come in for that. Yeah, if you remember that the assessment is someone 18 months behind the market value, yeah. that might explain a little bit of your of your questioning. Yeah, yes. That's true. But so. as as mayor, uh, I really want to thank those young men for having taken the time to come and present it to council and to have done a synopsis. Rich, did you? create this, this yes. PowerPoint? Yes, very good. Oh. <laughs> thank you. And so, <laughs> thank you so much for Any the Any other support. questions before we let them go? Council I was Brown. just going to say, I applaud you, because I think it's brilliant that you get into government. It's a brave thing to do. It's scary, but it's a brave thing to do, so I applaud you and everyone on the student council. So, 
a good job. Way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you so much. Both you. of those young men have gone to Parliament in Edmonton and were parliamentarian. I went to Ottawa. I, I went to Ottawa. You, you went to I Ottawa. Went to you went to Edmonton. 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 I, yeah, he went to Ottawa. I went to Edmonton. So, so it's really interesting to see your, your little involvement in local politics through mayors and news. And thank you so much for all you contributed. Well, thank you. Thank you. Having us on the council. Do you have any questions of us while we're here? And you're here. <laughs> I hope my slideshow and my our presentation uh, encourages some decision making further. Yeah, so thank you. What uh, what uh, you will receive as mayor and news is a letter of recommendation for having participated in mayor and news, and you can use. Use it every time you seek employment. Perfect. It's a very good letter of reference. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you guys. See you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming. Okay, our next delegation, Mr. Greg Hale, who is the Senior Wildlife Biologist for Alberta Environment and Parks. Welcome. Glad to have you here. You yeah, know, how you we may have a question or two, but we'll let you go ahead. Well, actually, it's a good segue. Uh, I'm here to learn more about what your guys' issues are, and I can provide you a little bit of input from our side of things. But okay, uh, I look around. Nice history. World War One. Uh, we got a World War One cemetery rededication in Lethbridge that's going on. That I have family members there, so it's nice to see the the pride in your community. And it, it's a privilege to be down here to be able to address you guys. Uh, and it sounds like you got a, a few concerns with urban deer. And uh, I just heard, and I, I, we were just talking about it, you had a grizzly bear potentially in, in town as well. Um, and we <laughs> would pick the baskets out about. <laughs> yeah, I know. So here we go. Uh, it, it's interesting and it's timely. Uh, we've been hearing the urban deer issue build within this. Uh, this southwest corner from town of Pincher Creek, McGrath, Karsten. I think you guys understand what's been happening in McGrath for quite a few years. Uh, some of the approaches, right, in that regard. Uh, we just struck, a, I'm, I'm just the past chair of our regional senior bio team, which uh, make up members from Medicine Hat, pretty much to Calgary, Cochrane, all the way down to Lethbridge, and then myself. Uh, how we're split, and you guys are kind of right in the middle, we have wildlife management units, which is WMU 300, which is to the west, over to Waterton, and then we have WMU management 108, which goes from Karsten all the way over to Warner and then up to Lethbridge. And those are kind of the boundaries. You guys think of town limits that way, or the county of Karsten. I just met with Murray uh, just this afternoon uh, on some matters. And so you just try to figure out that when we think about wildlife management or population management, we're thinking that kind of size of landscape. So if we're talking WMU 108, we're talking from Warner to Lethbridge over to here. And so with the numbers, we fly, we just flew, we have an aerial ungulate survey program. Uh, we try to fly every five years. We just flew uh, the deer population and pretty much all the ungulates in uh, this winter in WMU 108. So we've got brand new current population data, which is good. 300, it's a little bit outdated. Uh, the last time we flew deer was about 2008. But we carry forward through population projection modeling. So we've got all this data that tells us how deer populations grow. And then every year, and this is the month, we calculate the number of permits that are um, sustainable within that deer population. We try to balance the needs not only of hunters, but of landowners and now we're also taking into consideration what some of the urban deer uh, pressures are. Uh, part of this is that we're going to try to put together an urban, kind of a South Saskatchewan region urban deer strategy and draft by December of this winter, or that'd be 2018. So there's a lot of tools and techniques, and you probably hear a, a lot of different ways to how to get rid of deer within the town, uh, what residents can actually do. Uh, flowers sure taste good to deer, uh, you know, nicely cut lawns, and so the nicer your yard sometimes tend to be, and more manicured, yeah, that's the attraction to the deer. But what, what's common between McGrath, Pincher Creek, and Carson is they all have a lot of green space, and they all have creeks 
flowing right through town. So Lee Creek, so Lyle Lester uh, used to be the Fish and Wildlife Officer in town for years. Uh, I'd come down here, we had cougar issues, you had deer issues within town. So the, these issues kind of build, and with this winter, this is one of the toughest winters that we've seen, and talking to Jeff, we had a little bit of winter kill, uh, pretty much from Medicine Hat all the way out uh, to the Crowsness Pass where I'm at, uh, higher than, uh, than normal this year with mule deer. Uh, and it just so that will help correct the population. We're also putting out permits and allocations to try to reduce or soften those populations within your adjacent areas. So over the last three years, we've noticed ungulate numbers have been increasing. Landowners have been phoning in as well. We try to balance that. So the trend over the last three years, and it'll continue over the next two, is try to reduce those populations within the surrounding areas. Uh, the difficulty, that's just one tool right to reduce those numbers so what we're looking at and the strategy that we're going to uh, hopefully and this is where your guys is input and we just met with the town of pincher creek on may 28th as well um and and i've, I've talked to waterton park we've talked to bc uh, kimberly cranbrook they've had all these different strategies and tools that they've been trying to do deal with the same issues that you guys might be uh embracing and seeing as well with some of your residents um, John Clark, uh, he's our regional fish and wildlife, uh, the problem wildlife specialist now. Terry Mack used to be. Uh, John is the district officer out of Blairmore, but he's assuming those responsibilities and working with Arlen Bartz down here in uh, Carson. So John sends his regrets. He couldn't make it tonight, but he provided me uh, some, I guess, stats. And this is the thing that we don't hear from you enough. I guess, because when I was talking to Jeff, you guys are hearing a lot more uh, residents coming to the town. Uh, so in 2016, when we did a scan in our database, uh, we came up with zero complaints on mule deer. And that might surprise you guys that are saying, hey, wait a minute, I had mule deer issues or whatever. And we only had two complaints with whitetails in 2016, within the town limits, okay? And then in 2017, we only had uh, one complaint of a damaged tree and, and two complaints that are associated with injured deer. Uh, with white-tailed deer, we didn't have any complaints. So uh, in 2018, we've had one injured deer that we had to respond to and, and no white-tailed. And so when you go back to your own experience and what you're hearing from residents, that may not balance up. But if we don't hear from you or if we don't hear from residents, we don't get it into our databases. So when we do the scan, things are looking not so bad. So we just met with the town of Pincher Creek as well. And one of the, probably the best tools to do, and we just did this, uh, another colleague of mine um, went with John and they just did a drive early morning in Pincher <coughs> Creek here, just about May 24th or 25th or so. And, and it's a seasonal thing. So after the winter, you have a, higher concentration and now they're dispersing to have their young. Uh, now you'll have maybe a little bit more aggressive events, you know, with residents, at least that's where we're pinch your creek, you're walking your dog, Waterton Lakes National Park. And then in the winter time, you got a heavy concentration. And what was surprising, we had motor vehicle collision issues in the town of Pincher Creek. Mm -hmm. So you probably have some of that same issues down here. Back in about 2008, I heard complaints from Cardston County, for an example, um, about too high a deer numbers, vehicle collision. So we raised tags and we did supplementary tags, meaning that we could issue two tags uh, per license holder so they could shoot two white deer out of the surrounding area. But that doesn't help you a lot within the town limits. So Kimberly's looked at removal, they've looked at hazing, they've looked at changing fruit trees. But the one thing is about bird feeding during the winter time as residents, right? So you're feeding birds, and I don't know if this is the issue down here, but there is some bylaws that you might be also to look at about bird feeding. We do that in the past, no birding, bird feeding during bear season, because guess what brings in bears? Black bears love bird feed, right? So we enacted a bylaw in the Crowsness Pass to say no more bird feeding past a certain date, and you can't start until another date. And so that helps with the bear season, and it's reduced uh, some of the issues. But then pretty soon, there's some residents that like deer, other residents don't like deer. And then some residents in some towns this winter, because it's a hard winter, they're compassionate, they're well-meaning, 
but they've actually a little bit of extra out there for the deer, right? To give them a hand. And so all of these different things are attractants in our world. And so the more that you can look at, you will probably never eliminate all deer issues within the town of Carson. But if you look to Waterton Lakes National Park, they tried a whole pile of different tools. They set up a community group that uh, went through in a task team within the, the community. Town of Pincher Creek is looking to do the same. And then they can isolate and look at the different tools, what other jurisdictions and other agencies and regions have done, and then select which ones that you guys would might want to look at. But the first thing to do is to understand where those issues are and what neighborhoods are the highest incidences in the issues. And, and that's to engage your residences. And so I guess we're not, I, I didn't expect to be here today to try to come up with a whole bunch of different <coughs> solutions or toolboxes, but I'd like to throw out in the table to the town of Carston that we're willing to come back, sit down and actually have an, a, a, a separate intensive meeting on this issue, similar to what we're doing with the town of Pincher Creek as well, and, and we're going to be doing that with McGrath. Um, McGrath's tool was the quota hunt. Um, that, that was one way, and that's just only one tool, but what we found in other jurisdictions, it's only a short-term solution. And, and where Waterton, and I don't have the data in front of me, Barb Johnson or Dennis Manson out of Waterton, they were very open with uh, what worked for them. Um, but it, in my memory correctly, with their dog program and hazing during the fawning period right now, they took their aggressive incidences with residents almost to zero. You know, so there's, there's certain tools applied at a specific issue will work, but not one tool is going to solve it all for you. You're going to have to look at a variety of different things. Um, even translocating or capturing deer, uh, they've done a lot of that in uh, BC as well. Some of that has seen some short-term success, but long-term not. And so what I'm offering today again is just to really appreciate your guys's reaching out to us and I think this is the first way of understanding about what some of the issues and what you guys might be facing is uh, let's schedule another meeting at least that's our offer to sit down and as we pull together this uh, urban deer strategy for the south uh, we can sure work uh, with you guys accordingly in that regard so is there any any questions yes councillor Bangree and then councillor brown go ahead councillor Ladies first. Okay. Ladies first. Um, I was just going to ask, is there, so are you telling us that our residents should be calling in and complaining? Because they're calling us. Well, there's two ways that we can look at doing right. that. If we, if we work together, right. like the bylaw officer, let's say in Crow's Nest, there's a number of ways. They either phone us or they phone you guys as a point contact. Mm -hmm. We get that data. You guys share the data. We log it into our, our system as well. So when we have to, in our minister, also says, hey, what's happening down in Carston? We look at our data and we go, uh, looks limited okay. until you talk to you guys, right? right? And so I think we just need to look at a way of increasing that communication and see if you guys want to pursue it in a, in a, in a bigger fashion. That's where the Waterton really uh, worked well, in BC worked well. You set up a town task group or a, a community-based group mm -hmm. and then you can identify a point contact within in the town who's going to be the lead on that okay. and then they can communicate and then residents and it's really about resident awareness mm -hmm. about what they can do themselves but then also what the town can do uh, with some of the tools that you guys may want to look to implement um, the other thing to note is that there is we used to be together so solicitor general uh, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Officers, but they're in a separate ministry now. Mm -hmm. And we're in a separate ministry. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to make sure all the good communication is working, but some of that is also missing a bit. So Arlen also sends his regrets. He wasn't able to make it here today, John and Arlen. And then Mike Gruy, who handles WMU 108, he's out of Lethbridge. So you guys are caught right in the middle of all that, <laughs> as well as some of the communication that we saw. <coughs> Mr. Hale, yep. uh, is the deer population in Carson and surrounding area complements of the wildfire in Waterton? Not yet. Drove and, drove and not, yet. <laughs> not, not, not yet. You know what was interesting with the fire? I, I went down on the fire fairly shortly after, and the elk were already trying to find green up in the fall or in October. 
Uh, wildlife are pretty resilient. We've seen that in the Lost Creek fire. They'll move off for a short period of time, but they'll move right back into that fire in unburnt areas in the park. And I was just talking to Barb the other day, and the sheep and the elk and, and the moose are still there. So where, where, where you guys get it for the town of Karsten, and Mike Drew and I were talking, it's Lee Creek, and you got wonderful green space, and you got deer populations moving up and down, and that's why you have bear issues and you have cougar issues. So it's just something, if you guys want to set up more of a long-term strategy, we can sure work with you in that regard. Um, is there any, any other questions or anything that I can sure chat or try to answer today? Yeah, Joe, one thing for me, and, and Greg, I'd be curious your opinion on this. Yep. The, the last couple of years, we haven't had an office in Carson for Fish and Wildlife. Mm. And I think maybe one of the reasons our data has been low yep. is that there hasn't been that local contact point. Yep. Because if you call the number, it's still an active number, but it says, no one's going to get the voicemail, please don't leave a message. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the message says. Yeah, that's that's and not so, good business yeah, message. Yeah, but again, I recognize it's actually yeah. not even your department, yeah. right? You're an environment, and that's Fish and Wildlife. But it may be, mm -hmm. like Greg said, we need to establish a better method of communication there because we just simply haven't had an office to call locally and these aren't life or death issues they're simply nuisance issues mm -hmm. so how much effort are you going to put into making that call if the first one didn't work mm -hmm. you, you kind of peter out well and, and and a lot of people in case they don't they'll talk at coffee table or they'll yeah. talk at the kitchen table or whatever they don't want to express that out publicly right so i think that's something that we can look at and we're closing our blairmore office just closed High River just closed, so this is going to be more of an issue throughout some of the communities in, in southern Alberta, so I, I feel for you in that regard, but let, let's chat about that and follow up on how do we increase our communication. Councilor Brain, you just got another question, and Councilor Corbett. Mr. Hale, we, you talked about scheduling another meeting with, with the Council. Yep. Uh, what do you expect from the Council for this meeting? What do you want us to do? Well, I, I would like to see, I'd throw that out to you guys. What would you want out of that meeting for a town? Uh, what I'd like to do is to go over some what other communities are doing, look at BC, look at what the town of Pincher Creek might be kind of moving forward with and talk a little bit more about the urban deer strategy, some of the tools, we can share that. And then I'd like to see if you guys want to move forward with some ideas of your own, uh, see what the issues are. And one of the most important things to do in a town is there again is identify where your hot spots are, where the most of the issues are, and that takes a little bit of resident engagement and community. Just, just a question on um, habitual deer. Do you find that once they've been in a town for a year or two and they, they have their babies here, they're, they, they tend to grow the population? I, I live right on the south end of town across yep. the golf course. I see them in the field. Yep. 15, 20 at a time, but I never used to see them there, yep. but now I see them there all the time. Well, what, what you'll do and see, we also have one of the highest density of predator, you know, carnivores, large carnivores in the province, right, from bears, black bears, grizzly bears, cougars, wolves, right? Uh, they also find tolerance in seeking refuge in safe zones. So towns tend to be safe zones. Great. Right? <laughs> no, but but, but what Waterton found too in other jurisdictions, if you can put pressure on those females as they make choices about where to farm right before pre fawning okay. it'll take about a year to two years or three years before some of those individuals re will okay. return. So, so there is some strategies to deal with that seasonal target with a specific tool that may or may not work. You, you, you won't eliminate it just because of your landscape, that you should reduce it significantly. Yeah. Mayor? Can I just ask you, you were talking about really having a task team mm -hmm. in place. And I'm just wondering, in the other town where there is such a thing, mm -hmm. what is it composed of? There is councillors and there is members of the community. Is right. there some biologists, is there some yep. specialists? Yeah, all of the above. What you think would work best for your town and where other advisory groups or committees or working groups, however you want to call them, is representatives of residents as well as a council and then 
uh, subject matter experts at the table to help guide the process. But it's really about, it needs to come from the community, it needs to come from the town. You guys need to drive it, mm -hmm. right? And your residences. Yeah. Okay. Council Brown, then I have a comment. Yeah. So I also sit on the Communities in Bloom mm -hmm. board. Yeah. And so um, at our last, one of our last meetings, the question that is pretty much all around the table right now mm -hmm. is what can we plant mm -hmm. that will <coughs> not make the deer eat it, essentially, right? Like, are we talking 10-foot fences around the perimeter? Are we talking blood meal in, around our trees? Like, what is there, there, there anything? There is a suite of options out there that a lot of communities looked at, and it's a long list. Okay. Uh, okay. Shortly, if you go to Lee Valley on, on their website, they got an actual book in Lee Valley on their website about what residences can actually do to, to tame the deer or try to tame it depending on their gardening. Um, if you're gardening with a lot of broad leaves and a lot of, you know, vegetables and all that stuff, it's sometimes at the end of the day, it's like a fence, unfortunately. But without getting, jumping into the solutions, we can sure provide you what's worked and what hasn't. Okay. And, and then for residents, that's part of the awareness. You could right. actually, we could help you. Here's a bunch of tools. Awesome. People could go on your website. They could track it down, for sure. Thank you. Hey, yeah. uh, a question, maybe a comment, too. Yeah. Um, are there any communities that you're aware of in the South that use the uh, services of companies like Bear Scare? Right. My, my son works for Bear Scare up in Fort McMurray yep. and Grand Prairie. Yep. And so uh, the town of Pincher Creek is looking at a contractor to do wildlife conflict work within the town. Okay. So that is an option. That's and a, is a it's tool. a good option. I know up there, mm -hmm. I'm, my, my son's been there for about four years and, yep. and uh, you know, they have lots of non-lethal weapons yep. that they use and, yep. and they're able to control yep. the wolves and the bears and yep. uh, so, so you just well. have to tailor it and custom it, uh, customize it to ungulates and deer. Yeah. But there's there's similar version stuff, but yeah. there again it's just one tool. Yes. And then you got a whole suite of that. But that's part of it. And I, I know yeah. the town of Pinter Creek is looking at that okay. right now. Good. Any other questions? Thank you. We'll be discussing this and we will yeah. be getting back to you yeah. on on what we'd like to do moving forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, coming. I really appreciate the time and look forward to chatting with you in the future. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, Grant and Shane, the floor is yours and the screen too. Have you guys afford there already to go? We do. We just don't want to have any issues. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're fine there. Welcome to your wives that have just showed up. Yeah. If they have them come. that. Can we move? Yeah, let's move. Just pull it right over. <coughs> How much time are you going to need? I just need to know when I have to cut you off. <laughs> no, no Two more days. days. <laughs> Two days. <laughs> You're buying breakfast and lunch for tomorrow. Is is. is Half an hour going to do yet? Probably half an hour. That's great. I think I'll just move over here. Well, thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Um, we talked about using name tags because now that Grant's grown a beard, we know that you can hardly tell us apart. So, <laughs> so you had to follow him, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, so um, we're, we are the uh, Earth Initiatives. Um, it's, uh, again, just a bit of a review, planning and project management firm, Grant Holly and myself. And we're going to move quite quickly through this. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, summarized in, in a way I hope that uh, is clear and concise and will recall uh, to, the, to you as the, to the types of things that we discussed last time as well as what we have now on the table. So uh, the Carston Trail Gateway to Alberta, we proposed a, a two-phase project and uh, uh, first of all we, re we 
we propose a repurposing of the visitors information center to include Wally's Beach Museum displays while maintaining its function as a visitor information center and in the broader context uh, this is um, includes the Main Street enhancements okay um, Grant you just want to jump in and oh, okay so as you recall, a couple of months ago we, we were here and, and we proposed a number of things and uh, after that presentation we said we would come back to you with uh, three or four things and that's what we're going to do. Now we had proposed uh, and promised to you um, that we would come back to you with some stru structural and architectural concepts for repurposing the visitor center into a, uh, a prehistory museum uh, and we'll get to those in just a bit. We proposed that we would bring you a, uh, at least a high-level project schedule, and we have that, uh, and it's tied up with uh, the numbers, uh, the financial side of it, uh, that you'll see here in a moment. Um, so that will be coming shortly. And uh, <coughs> number three, which is just what I said, the financial requirements and a funding plan. How, uh, how much is it going to cost, and uh, how are we going to pay for it, and, and how, how long will it take? So uh, this is all, all coming. And that we would come with uh, draft terms of reference or at least some logistical considerations for a contract between the town of Cardston and ourselves to begin the planning and design process and actually put this, uh, uh, this project on the ground. And um, in doing this, uh, this is exactly what we did. After we left you two months ago, we went away and we did, I'd have to say it was an awful lot of work uh, more, I think, than, than we had, uh, had uh, anticipated. But we did um, a lot of work, and, uh, and I should mention at this point that uh, we'd offer our thanks to uh, uh, Jeff Shaw. He, uh, he gave us great support and some information that we needed to be able to come back to you with, uh, uh, with a very logical and, uh, and accurate plan here on all, on all of these things. Um, so that's what we promised you. And uh, so we're going to start out here now and, and make the report. Uh, now what, uh, what we put up on the wall here, um, we'll be telling the, the story of what we've been doing over the last two months and, and what we see for the future of this project. We have at the end, uh, all of this will be, uh, we have a, uh, a handout for you. All of this and more detail. Uh, so don't worry about taking notes. You'll you'll be able to take this home with you and uh, uh, and and study it and look at it. And I'm sure there'll be a quiz uh, after. You can count um, on it. <laughs> so the first thing that uh, Shane and I started with is uh, said, okay, if we're whoops, did I get that? Um, yes, that we we uh, started with what we call a thesis statement, and that's just a fancy word. To, for uh, what is this all about? And so uh, you'll see the thesis statement in the written material that, uh, uh, that we have. It basically talks about, uh, we proposed this whole project to you uh, primarily as an economic development initiative, but it's much bigger and broader than that. It includes uh, uh, a very strong educational component, uh, some, some uh, scientific uh, components in there, and, um, and um, I think one of the bigger things that we, uh, that we landed on is that we feel this, uh, this project, this museum, will really contribute to one more bit of, uh, of a community identity, okay? Something more for, for Cardstonians to be proud of and to, be say, and to say, this is part of our story and an important part of our story that hasn't been told yet. So it's, uh, it's more than just uh, an academic exercise or, a, or an economic development exercise. It's lots of things. And you'll, uh, I hope you can, you can study the thesis statement and, uh, and figure that out. Uh, did I miss anything there? I don't think so. OK, so the next uh, thing that we looked at, I'll turn it back to Shane, and he'll talk about uh, the actual display elements. Okay, well, we've spent some time exploring this, uh, uh, but uh, as you may recall, we had two exterior displays that we would had proposed, and uh, the first being um, the mammoth 
uh, trek, which was the which uh, we've kind of decided the the most effective would be seven life-size sheet steel mammoth silhouettes uh, parked out on a piece of land that the the horizon just uh, as you're looking north from Carway, so just uh, about a, a, maybe two miles up the road, and uh, I let's see, just a second. Hmm. Well, we're minus our photos on that for some reason, but uh, I, I, yeah, I hope you can recall, and it is in the notes as well. Uh, there's a there's a picture or a photo that's uh, uh, kind of been put together to show what that would look like. Uh, No, it's not coming up for some reason. Imagine, if you will, a herd of mammoths <laughs> trekking across. <laughs> uh, and also the outside display, there was a, it was a mammoth hunting event. Uh, and of course, uh, this is just reviews, but we do have a graphic that shows that as well. A couple of scimitar cats. We wanted to emphasize the dramatic because we felt like that is a great way to get people to stop uh, and say, what is this all about? What's going on here? It looks interesting. And this is the one that you were going to have out in front of the out, visitor center? Out, yes, yes. Out in front center. of the visitor center with a mammoth. There's a yeah. couple of scimitar cats that are attacking this mammoth, a couple of paleo hunters who would be competing with this. Uh, uh, so uh, again, a very dramatic display. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, so uh, we've actually looked at some possibilities in ways to produce these um, sculptures and uh, we're in conversation with the, the, the best and latest technology. We've talked to some scanning people who can scan, uh, uh, work with digital files that are produced by digital artists to actually create these kinds of things. It's really fascinating. Um, and we had uh, one mammoth track, actually, we had, them, had it printed, or not printed, but scanned. And it's incredible detail, and then that's just, that digital file is sent off to a printer that can actually print that. So, very interesting. Uh, the main interior display components, um, now we have access to the only mammoth trackway and uh, so we thought a very exciting and interesting thing in this facility would be to have uh, the full-size mammoth trackway. And um, there, the, uh, of course, what good is a trackway without a mammoth stomping those tracks <laughs> into the ground? So we think that a, a mammoth model would be quite an excellent addition to that display. And uh, it would be a very powerful display and one of the main attractions inside the building. And, and maybe at this point, it, it's important to understand that, you know, if we got this dramatic display outside, we need something equally as good inside so that when people, you know, visit the center, they say, okay, wow, this is, they don't go away saying, wow, I, the, it's great outside display and nothing else to see. But... Uh, we don't. We want to do more. This is this is really interesting to, to sit here and listen to Ridge. I haven't seen Ridge since he, so I didn't even recognize him, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, we want to tell the story. We don't want to just put down a trackway and this is uh, some nice science data and you know. And uh, we we want to do much more than that. And because we've kept this local and we're doing this locally and we're trying to do this locally, we can tell the story how we want and. And so we want to tell the Mammoth Trackway story. So with, uh, um, we have some tr terrific reference material that we can draw from. And we had many students and staff from the high school all involved. We could not have done this project without them. We want to tell those stories and find ways to do that in there. And uh, I was, if Reg was still here, I'd have him stand up and tell you the story about how he as a kid found a T-Rex tooth you know, out at St. Mary's Dam. And it was just a spectacular find. And, well, you can one-off that on the front page of the, the Cardston paper, uh, and he can clip that and throw, show that to his posterity. 
or that can become an element, a human interest story that we can actually highlight in our museum. Does that make sense? Uh, I think that's, it's, it's one of our fundamental um, uh, objectives with this particular types of displays that we're thinking about doing. Uh, the eccentrics, one-of-a-kind um, artifacts, I briefly mentioned those as well last ta time and, and uh, referred to a painting that uh, it's, it's a painting that I have done. I did my, personally, I did the scientific uh, work on the eccentrics artifacts. They're, they're very unusual artifacts and have been seen nowhere else except for out here at Wallace Beach. So uh, that can be, that's a, another main uh, type of display that we can focus on. Uh, the, we've thought about a way to capture the, the essence of Wallace Beach in a trackway miniature diorama. So a large oval diorama that's uh, scaled down, of course, and able to, uh, which features the extinct animals that we're finding at Wally's Beach, extinct musk oxen, scimitar cats, uh, mammoths. Uh, we just have a whole host of extinct animals that we can focus on, including <coughs> the only known occurrences of humans hunting two of these species, and that is the, the horse and the camel. So that little diorama could have a little corner over here with a camel hunting event, one over here with a horse hunting event, and uh, then the other animals, much like you would see on the Serengeti Plain, all intermingling uh, in this little diorama. Uh, we do have access to, to the, some of the material from Molly's Beach. We do not have a complete camel skeleton, but we, I think we can get one. Uh, so life-size extinct horse and camel skeletons could be featured. Uh, just uh, really nice display items. Uh, the scimitar cat discovery, one of a kind find in, in, in Canada. We have the only scimitar cat teeth that have ever been found, so another element that would be very exciting as uh, part of our display. Uh, other exceptional local stories, which I won't get into, but we do have some very dramatic stories that could be told uh, and, and some artifacts that could be shown in regards to this. Uh, and a possibly a gift shop information. The information desk, of course, we will maintain that as part of the visitor information component of this facility. Uh, project design elements. So, um, I, I'll run through this quite quickly. Uh, this just give you an idea of what's involved in the design process. So we have to uh, land on a theme, uh, we need to do the research, and quite honestly, there's a great deal of research in, in putting together a project like this. So that is part of our proposal. Uh, the in the planning phase, uh, building di the, the building design uh, and display design, um, there are four uh, sub-processes that we would be focused on. The conceptual design, rough floor design, which I will be showing you shortly the schematic or the storyboard drawings, um, uh, develop design, establishing uh, the details, interpreting panels, putting the flesh on the bones, so to speak, and then the working drawings, engineered drawings and blueprints. Now, we do have to do all of this stuff professionally, particularly uh, when we're applying for some funding. Uh, there will be requirements to, to fill this uh, with the professional drawings and things like that. Uh, then we would focus on, of course, the fabrication uh, that's building the display items and, and the facility, doing the, the necessary things with the facility, and finally the installation. And all of this, again, is in the um, document that we'll be handing out at the end. Okay, this is going to be a problem. <laughs> Up the it's not going to bring up our drawings. No, why don't we hand up the... the uh, yeah, let's do that. <coughs> now, if you turn in this, 
uh, your paperwork here follows pretty much the uh, the slideshow. Um, and in just a moment, I'll tell you what page we're on. I've got it now. Oh, we got it working. Yeah. Okay, there we are. Okay, uh, I'm not sure what page that is on, but. Uh, Okay, this is the visitor center as it is, the, as it stands. Now, what we are going to propose is an addition onto the building. And this will make a lot of sense when we, if you look up on the screen, you'll see that we have added quite an addition on, um, and there's a reason for that, of course. Uh, so, when we put the main display elements in, it'll look something like this. So, uh, the mammoth tracks themselves would take up uh, most of that space. And then, the, as you come in the front doors, which is at the bottom of the screen, bottom right, come in the front doors, directly in front of you would be that miniature display that I was talking about. And then uh, the mammoth track display would be to the left of that. Now, at the very end of this, on the west, that would be the west wall. So on the left, that left uh, part of the drawing, it would be the area where we would display this mural painting that I was talking about and focus on the eccentric artifacts. Uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, projections off the building that uh, are there for a couple of reasons, but uh, that that uh, we could put those skeletal displays that I talked about there. Oh yeah. No, it's so good. Yeah. So these two projections right here would be the skeletal displays. Here's our diorama, our miniature diorama. Uh, we would have to move the uh, information desk over here. Uh, it's right now. It's right here, but uh, the space would be too cramped, of course. So that would be a much uh, more reasonable place to move that. A couple of uh, just little display things we're toying with right now, but remember, these are conceptual uh, uh, drawings, so we're not uh, we're not settled on anything at this point. Uh, now we do have a 20 foot high ce ceiling, so uh, we're th we're thinking about uh, putting a mezzanine on this, uh, which I think is the building was initially designed to have. But th anyways. Um, uh, we, there's lots of display uh, items that could go up here and then uh, an overlook that's looking down on the tracks which makes a lot of sense. So standing up here you'd be able to look down on the Mammoth Gallery and, and see this as well as the other displays that we have in, in that area. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Have you ever thought of doing some interactive uh, we have. Or something like that. Yeah, well, and there's so much of that going on right now, and, and there's, there's uh, you, you go through any modern museum, and you'll I see. Have that. That's what you see electronic people. things where, where you can. We have an idea about doing that with QR codes, mm -hmm. uh, and using a QR code, uh, and a lot of people now with their phones can have, uh, can read a QR code, and, um, uh, it will take them to a web page that shows videos and all kinds of different things that could be built into the, a QR code uh, interpretive uh, way of doing this. The beauty of doing it that way is we don't have technology that we're constantly trying to maintain. Uh, it's still a, just a physical thing. It's a Q QR code that will never have to change. It doesn't even have a light bulb. So. You know, those kinds of things are, are under consideration, and it's, it is something that we're talking about. But there, again, it's, it's and, and we're not throwing out the idea of any other way of displaying these things uh, technically, but that's the next phase that we would move into uh, with, the, with the display designs and things like that. You know, what, what's going to be the most effective way to get this information across? I'm just thinking for all age. Yes. 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 As a teacher, so am I. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, and uh, we'll have something to say along that line as well here in a bit. Okay. This is uh, this is the south elevation. This is what the 
building would look like. Uh, again, here's the initial building here, and with the uh, added projection on, would look something like this. Again, just conceptual at this point, and uh, if approved, of course, this would go to an architect, and we would develop uh, that under their supervision, of course. Okay, well, let's move into the fun stuff. I'll, I'll turn that over to you. Are you ready for questions yet? Oh. You want to well, actually, yes. Yeah, sure. Is there, yeah, let's have Councilor a Councilor Drew, I'll let you ask the questions. We've both got the same question. Yeah, I'm just wondering about the land issue on mm -hmm. the quad there. Is there enough? The, yes. Because uh, there's part of a parking lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you like to speak to that, or you want me to tell, you, tell them what, what we discussed? Uh, I'm trying to think what the part about acquiring the land, or is there enough well, land? There, there is enough like, land. Yeah, okay, there's well, enough land. Well, there's yeah. enough land. Um, and I'm in negotiation. This is actually before there, they came on the scene, to put it that way. We've been looking at acquiring that land from the province to get them to dispose of it, so we had a lot more uh, discretion over what we did with it. So there is sufficient land to put to put the building that you saw, the addition, yeah. to the west of the How existing How far west land. does that property actually go to, Jeff? Um, the other is subdivided into the Remington Museum at the curb, the parking lot. Okay. So when I talked to infrastructure, the intent was to get a good chunk of that parking lot, too. So I'm asking for a price on that. Go ahead, Council Court. Is, is, is Remington being kept abreast of the information, all the stuff that's going on? They will be. No, Absolutely. Not at this point. But not I'm just point. wondering, I can only see it as enhancing that museum. I'm not sure. They'll see it that way. Uh, I, I, I guess we need to live up on speed on that. And, and when I initially proposed this project five, eight years ago, uh, the Earth Project, it looked a whole lot different than this. Yeah, and I was uh, in contact with Howard and, and we talked extensively about the ways that we could kind of feed off of each other. And uh, so, yeah, I think we'll get 100%. Because yeah, I see nothing but positive for them. Yeah. Well, we, even, we have a nice segue to the museum because Absolutely. we have the first humans hunting horses, the first human interaction with horses in the area. What a great way to introduce what's, what it became, yeah. you know. Exactly. And if people are coming for this, they'll definitely just move on a little further oh, west to see that. I, I highly expect so, and, and it's, it's absolutely needed. Uh, the numbers for the uh, uh, museum, the Remington, are abysmal, quite frankly, compared to even other museums here in Alberta. So, you know. yeah. Thank you. Councilor Rankin. Uh, I hate to throw this question out, but I'm going to. You're calling it the Cardston Trail Gateway to Alberta. Mm -hmm. The problem that I have with that is we have a Mormon trail already put in. Now, are people going to group them all together, both of these together, and thinking that they're the same? Are they going to identify <coughs> the Mormon Trail with the Cardston Trail? Uh, hopefully both would be my answer to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly they would support each other. I don't see it any other way if there is some confusion there. Um, but Grant, why don't you explain why we landed on trail? Yeah, uh, and we talked a little bit about this when we first presented a couple of months ago. We landed on that name of trail because it is really a western thing. And, and uh, you, you go to Calgary, all of the major roads through Calgary, Sarsi Trail and Stony Trail, everything's a trail. Same in Edmonton. Uh, and the road between Cards, uh, Calgary and Edmonton has always been the, 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 the C&E Trail, the Calgary and Edmonton Trail. Mm -hmm. Calgary Trail, of course, going south, and, and that's the name of the major road in, yeah. in Edmonton. Same going north in Calgary, you get on Edmonton Trail, it heads north. So, uh, and it comes from our history of people came here on the trails. There were trails across the prairie, and, and the Mormon Trail, certainly the trail coming up from the south. So our concept was in a very broad concept uh, or, or context uh, the Cardston Trail uh, would be named after Cardston now would incorporate all of these elements we've got the uh, the Mormon Trail that we could 
incorporate into into tourism attraction and you know trails going to Waterton and and everywhere else and uh, well, it would take some time but that whole road from the border well even south of the border coming north and the same coming south because I believe personally that uh, a lot of uh, our biggest audience will be getting northern Albertans to use the Cardston Trail to come south and, and go south so that's that's how I would, would put it is Using the term the Cardston Trail would incorporate the, the Mormon Trail, which is a part of it, and the, all of these other historic trails, and hopefully feed into you know the use of the, the trails in Calgary and Edmonton and in between, and going uh, going east to Winnipeg, all of those that, that were the were the trails. The only thing the only thing that concerns me is is as I identify with the Mormon Trail. Um, we're identifying the actual settlement and the Mormons coming west. You know, it's two different concepts. Cardston Trail is identifying prehistoric, you know, uh, starting in this area. And so I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to be able to separate that from people. Are, are they thinking, oh, we're just going down to see how the Mormons come into town? The back of a dinosaur mammoth? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> no, no. But initially, when they look it up, you know, are they gonna are they gonna find the Mormon Trail or the Carson Trail first and identify these as as the same? Well, I think that's fair comment, and and I think it's something that we could all put our minds to mm -hmm. to make it work. Um, I personally, I see the Cardston Trail as the larger thing. You know, you're coming to the, t the town, the community of Cardston, whether you're coming south or coming north, and you're on the Cardston Trail, and then we can talk about all the other trails. The Mormon Trail is a, uh, the, the second part of that, because the Cardston Trail, as you very well pointed out, um, we can associate it with this prehistoric uh, uh, material. So I think, and, and you'll see, if we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, in a little bit more detail, that a big part, uh, I think for this whole project to be successful and to be well placed in a Cardston Trail or a bigger uh, tourist attraction area is going to pr be precisely what you uh, have put your finger on here is the, the communications and the marketing. How do we sell this to people? How do we inform people that the Cardston Trail includes the Mormon Trail but it's bigger, there's more to it. And we've got now the, the prehistory museum and you've got, uh, well the last time we were here listed, you've got seven or eight wonderful tourist attractions here in town and we need to package that and sell it in a concerted and, and integrated and unified fashion is my, uh, is my opinion. Yeah, I was going to say somehow we've got to tie in the Blackfoot the yes. and, and the natives and, yeah. and, and, and the um, Buffalo jump and yes. all that needs to be all tied in. See, you're, you're, you're hitting on a key point. And if we're looking at, uh, you know, it, it, this, speaking of selling this, uh, we, we are going to be selling this to the, per, to the provincial government pro first and, and the federal government po possibly second. But uh, to sell this, to be able to say that this is the gateway to the other trails in the province then, then we've got a very, we're unified in something that's already there and in place. Uh, so and I appreciate your comment, by the way, and I agree with Grant that, you know, we really, uh, that th this, is, this is just the gateway. When we don't want this trail to be seen as a prehistoric trail, it's, the prehistory is just the beginning yeah. part of it, and you're going to hit that. It's, it's, it's something that we can key in on that is, uh, has, a, has a great potential to, to draw people to the area. Uh, next to the dinosaurs, you can't beat you know, prehistoric animals and humans living here at the same time. Uh, so uh, I think, I think we're, we're kind of all on the same page as far as, as that goes uh, with anybody that we've talked to. So Just remember one thing, yeah. you'll need to consult. With, with the with the native people of First Nations, very much so. Well, we we, we, have, we have some things in yeah. in, in pl planned specifically for yeah. this, including presentation to uh, the chief and council. 
Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Right, that was my question, by the way. So you oh, know that. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And we don't have it here, but you may recall our uh, last time we were here, we had that as phase three. Uh, you know, we have the prehistory museum, Main Street enhancements, and then on the north of town, we've got our uh, our, our our friends, uh, our, our native friends, and uh, yeah, certainly that is an important part of the story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it connects everything together. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, any more questions before uh, we get into the the really fun stuff, which is <laughs> the the money? Um, and uh, answering the question, how much is this going to cost and who's going to pay for it? Do you have the clicker doodle? Yeah, I got the clicker doodle. It's right here. Oh, it's right there. Now, you have, uh, you have um, this in front of you. Let me explain this, and maybe I should explain the background to this particular page. Um, this is the reason that we didn't get the written material to you ahead of time, because it probably wouldn't, well, it would have raised a whole lot of questions, and uh, what we couldn't put in here was how we got to this. Um, we have spent literally probably 80% of our time over the last two months um, fleshing out the display elements that, uh, as best we could at this point in time, the changes went through with you. What are the various display elements? And then we had to go through and figure out what's it going to cost to build those? So. What we did, and I'll, I'll use my little red pointer. Now you see here in the top left, we've got components. One, two, three, four, five, six of them there. Uh, these are, we, we took the concept for the, the prehistory museum and broke it into six elements and they're basically uh, where they're physically located. So the first element was the visitor center, the existing building, the envelope refit. So we, we kind of dissected that and said, okay, uh, well, let me back up because what we did for each of these six is we, we broke it down. Um, and we, there is a sample in there of the various components of how do we, what are we going to do in there and how, uh, how is it all going to fit together. And so this was the, uh, the best way we came up with to try to uh, get some dollar figures attached to it. Um, so Shane mentioned the mammoth trek. Uh, let's start with that one. Uh, might be a little easier. And you remember the picture uh, of the silhouettes, the sheet steel, mammoth trekking across the countryside. That became a discrete element for us. And we, uh, we took that and broke it down into the various components. Well, you know, we've got, a, we've got first of all, to do the research, uh, come up with some, some designs and some patterns for seven different uh, two-dimensional mammoth figures. And then we've got to build them. And we've got to build them so that they'll uh, withstand the, the weather, and particularly the wind sitting out on a hill south of Karsten. How do you mount them so that they don't uh, blow over, or so that the local uh, uh, hunters uh, don't knock them over when they're shooting at them. Uh, all of those kinds of things uh, we, uh, we considered and contemplated and we did a lot of research uh, finding out what's been done with similar things elsewhere. We haven't found a mammoth trek uh, of this sort done in this way, uh, but we did do uh, some research and, and uh, you know, into what the costs of the steel are, installation and everything else. So, with that element, looking at that, we built the project, uh, and this is where the schedule part of it comes in, and this is just my quirkiness. Uh, we used year zero. Year zero is right now, 2018, is how we looked at it, and we used zero rather than one for this year because it's not a full year. Uh, if you approve this project, we've, we're ready to go July 1st. Uh, so basically this represents, these numbers represent half a year of, uh, uh, half of, of what would, would, would take for the next three years. So uh, we broke it all down. Uh, each of these six represents uh, about three full legal size pages of financial spreadsheets where we did the, the estimates and the projections, and uh, we reworked them and reworked them. 
uh, to where we're comfortable with them. We feel they're very accurate um, and, uh, and numbers that, that will work in, in this context. We didn't want to put all of that in, uh, all of that detail, because it, uh, it hardly made sense to us by the time we had <laughs> looked at it so long. Uh, but what you have here is the roll-up. When we got to the end of the mammoth trek, we broke it out tasks per year, and this is how it worked out year three. And when you get to this column, this is what each component costs. Okay, so we, and then we did the same with the visitor center, the uh, existing building refit. And this is basically just construction, well, demolition and con reconstruction, uh, not including displays. And then you get down here, and this is the displays for the existing building, okay? The one outside the uh, visitor center building that we just talked about, the Mammoth Hunt, uh, is there. And then the addition, constructing the addition uh, to the building, and, uh, and then the displays within that, within that addition. So that, those are the six categories that we broke it, uh, broke it down into to get our cost projections as accurate as we could and to make sense of, of a pretty complex, uh, complex project. And I should mention that uh, once we started doing this thinking, this was really when we figured out, or very early, that there was so much in, on the display side, and we have so many historic resources uh, to put in the building, this was when we really, it struck us that we couldn't do what we had promised you we thought we could do, what we told you we thought we could do was putting a museum just in the existing building. It simply would not work. Um, Shane did a, a drawing or a, 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 an artist rendering. We took all of our resources and scaled them and put them in there and they all fit, but there was no room for people uh, to come in and see them. <laughs> so uh, that was how we landed on, on the, uh, the concept of it. If this is going to work, it's got to have a, a bigger building and that's how we came up with the the, uh, the Mammoth Gallery edition. Now the last category here is uh, project management, communications, and administration. Uh, and this is, just as it says, this is uh, getting us to where, this is the work that Shane and I uh, will be doing. And the things that uh, aren't directly display related, but they're managing the project. Okay, and we broke that down year by year by year as well. So. Uh, now you can see we've got a yearly breakdown which gives us a yearly, this is the annualized cash flow analysis. What, what's it going to take over the next three and a half years? And uh, this is what, what we have come up with. Um, now if you add those numbers this way and these numbers this way, uh, I've double checked them many times and this is the, the, the grand total number of what this project, uh, what we project this project will cost. Now I have to qualify that by saying that uh, we're very confident of these numbers, year zero. Next year, uh, we're pretty confident. But beyond that, and even next year, it starts to get a little iffy when you start looking at uh, the last, uh, what's it been, the last six weeks or so, uh, very big, um, jump in the price of oil and that takes some time to work its way through the economy but if that if oil costs and gasoline costs stay up we're going to see some inflation happening there not just in our transportation but in shipping costs in material costs anything that's petroleum based those material costs are going to go up uh, we see other uh, things happening in the economy here and beyond the whole uh, free trade thing that uh, seems to be getting more and more volatile these days. We don't know, I don't know anyone who can predict what's going to happen, but I think we're pretty safe in saying that we're going to see some es escalation. Uh, certainly by year two, we're going to see some escalation. So how do you, how do you plan, you know, how do, how do you, three and a half years out, how do you say, well, that's a, a very firm number? It's not. And we need a bit of flexibility there, or a bit of contingency, if you will, um, so that when we get to year two and we find that, yeah, shipping costs are a whole lot more, or 
uh, nylon uh, material for our 3D printing to, to make a, a, a mammoth um, is up by two or three or five percent. So what we did is we put this line in saying, give us two percent average per year just as a cushion. Uh, it's not a really big number, but that really would give us, uh, give us that contingency of that cushion. So a bit of wiggle room is, uh, is what that's all about. Uh, now along the road, uh, we, we put this in, we've talked a little bit about the World Heritage sta status, uh, our World Heritage um, sites that are close. Wally's Beach certainly deserves to be um, uh, designated as a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. It will, that will be a great uh, boon to the marketing and, and communication strategy that we're talking about to tell the story of the Cardston Trail one more reason to come along, we've got a World Heritage Site. Now we're surrounded by them. Well, not surrounded, but certainly here in Alberta, we've got one to the west, Waterton Glacier, is the World Heritage Site. One to the north, Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump, is the World Heritage Site. Uh, and I was involved direct, directly in that one. You go to Drumheller and, of course, uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park and that whole uh, um, dinosaur business um, is a World Heritage Site. Uh, get over into BC and there's, there's a couple more uh, but we have those three very close to us here in Alberta and this one would be uh, would add the fourth and it's in our front yard really it's so close uh, here in Cardston we feel that as part of this project we would like to pursue this um, we'll need a bit of money to, to be able to, to pursue that so we put in another uh, $25,000 um, which brings the estimated total project cost to just about 4.3 million here. Now, I know that that's a big number, and uh, particularly for a small town. Uh, it's a very big number. Um, <coughs> but we, we feel that it's a, a, a pretty accurate number. What we would uh, recommend uh, it doesn't show here, I think it shows in your paper copy that uh, uh, when you go away and discuss this and approve it, uh, perhaps the, the simplest thing to do so that we have that cushion um, is if you can approve 4.5 million um, as a ceiling. Uh, we are very confident that, that the project can be contained within that. And we've discussed um, financing the project uh, with, uh, with Jeff, and uh, um, you will find in the, uh, in the written material, we as taxpayers, Shane and I, uh, we're taxpayers just like you are, and you look at a number like that and you go, my taxes are paying that. We are very aware uh, of, uh, of the uh, reticence, is that the right word, uh, of taxpayers to, to spend that kind of money. And, Maybe on something like this, it seems even even worse. But uh, uh, Jeff and I have discussed this, and and uh, he's assured me, and, and I'm certain this will be part of your discussion that uh, there are ways to finance this through standard municipal financing channels uh, without sparking a tax increase. And actually, for my part, if uh, if it had to spark a tax increase, I would I suspect I would just say no, thank you. Um, I wouldn't want to go there with you. Now that's the, the big bad news. Um, not, no, good news, bad news. $4.3 million. Uh, there are grants out there. And I've listed two here. CCSF stands for uh, Canada Cultural Spaces Fund. It's a federal program. I have worked with them uh, just last fall and into this winter on another project and they, uh, they have a lot of money available. It's very stringent for the requirements to tap into it, but I think this project is just uh, meets the requirements very well. Uh, so that federal program, CFEP is a provincial program and there's, uh, there have just recently been changes made to that that ups the ceilings for the amount of money that's available uh, for projects of this sort. Uh, so I'm fairly confident, and we're looking at this figure here now, of a million dollars that uh, we should between those two programs and perhaps there's two or three others that I would, that I would like to, to 
to look at on your behalf, I think we can reduce that big number by a million dollars at least in grant income, which makes it a little more palatable um, than there on the bottom line. So that's, a, I hope, a concise summary of how did we arrive at this and how, does the, how do the numbers work themselves out? What are we asking you to support? That's it. And I guess uh, if you have any questions on, on that now, uh, we can certainly, uh, certainly answer them. Mayor? The question I have looking at this is your year zero. Your year zero is 2018. The budget already has been approved for 2018, and I don't know how we fit that in. Well, um, that's my question. That's your question. With, with this uh, figure coming now after the budget has been established, mm -hmm. the, the tax uh, sent out. See what I mean? Yes. There, are some, there is not yeah. 385,000 yeah, kicking around. You just don't have it that sitting in the cash register. No, uh, it's just yeah, not that. We understand that, and my, my re reply to, to that would be, these numbers, the yearly all allocations are not set in stone. In an ideal world, we'd love it to go just like this. Uh, and we are ready, Shane and I are ready to hit the ground running July 1st, if, if you were to- No, I totally understand that, yeah. but if the budget, the yeah. money is not in the budget, how it's do you stopped. run? Uh-huh. Uh, and I would say that we're ready to go. We could do with, we could make do until January 1st with uh, a lot less than the 385,000 that you see there. Uh, and we'd have to, we'd have to work that out with, with Jeff. Just so that we can get going. No, I totally uh, hear you. But uh, Alabama, I was thinking, oh, yeah. there is a discrepancy of about six months here. Yeah. Yeah. And that, is, yeah, that's just how it, how it worked out. Um, so, yeah, we're flexible in what we would be able to do this year. Uh, we would need some funds, but uh, if that is not possible, as you say, it's not. And, and I, I understand, I understand that, you know, it would have been really nice if we had done this last June and you would have it in this. Well, um, yeah, we start budget negotiations yeah. in October. Yeah. So October of 2018 is when we worked the yeah. 2019 budget. So, and we appreciate that. And uh, all we can say is we're negotiable. You know, okay. we'd love to get going on it and, and we can we can adjust things so that uh, so that we can if uh, if there's a portion of that. And that'll be up to you to tell us what portion you might be able to, to give. If there's zero dollars available, well, we could look at, we'd have to look at, at reformatting things. Um, now, a big part of the schedule, <coughs> uh, perhaps a question in your mind is, well, you know, three and a half years, that's, that's a, a long time, but it's not really. Uh, we are looking at, maybe we should go to the next slide, which may answer some of your questions, but we can certainly come back. Uh, I'm looking for, what's, we have the one with the, uh, 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 mine, mine just went blank. Maybe before we go there, we've got a yes. couple of questions here, Grant. Sure, go right ahead. Councillor Bainbridge got a question, and Councillor Brown's got a question. Grant Shane, to support the mayor's comments and question, we don't have a strategic planning session until September, September. the end of September which happens at our AUMA convention. We are going to take a day early and, and do the strategic planning. Something like this, I think, would come out of that planning session. So, you know, and then we have to look at what kind of money can be advanced to it if that's part of the, the schedule. If it comes out then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Brown and Councilor Court. So the very first thing that the taxpayers are going to ask is, you're spending how much of our money on this, which is valid. So, you know, 4.5, let's just say, to round it up. So $4.5 million. 
but the thought is that by opening up Carway, we're bringing business to Cardston, right, to spend their money here. And while they're here on our trail, that they're going to our museums, they're staying in our hotels, they're, I'm just trying to put it mm -hmm. out there. That, that That's is, exactly it. Yeah. Right? I yes. mean, this is a pile of money for the average Joe. But if right. we look at it blinders off and we try and see the trickle down effect. 20 years down the road. Right. This is economic <coughs> development, and, and really, tourism is, uh, you know, don't have to do yeah. a whole lot of research to understand yeah. what kind of impact that can have on a community, and, and it's something that we haven't really been able to tap into previously, so we're, that's kind of why we're really gung-ho on, on moving this forward. So, sorry, on that, so just, just to be clear, so... The Remington Center was has been here a long time. Do you think that brought economic growth to this community? No, because it's it's the uh, it has such a small audience appeal. Uh, the difference here is we have a wide audience appeal, and it's very in popular culture. You know, the just the subject matter itself uh, will, uh, and, and then of course it's all about communication and marketing in terms of getting this stuff out there right. but uh, we have ideas about doing that of course and uh, uh, which we can but we're we're not prepared to out, to lay that out right. here you know right. we're in right. that state but is but our marketing cost in this uh, in the administration we have management well it, and that's the question is it, it is it in that there's some marketing costs okay. built into what you just saw right. uh, related to the museum itself Right. Okay, but as I mentioned earlier, in the broader context, we don't believe for a moment that building this museum is going to suddenly bring, you know, 400,000 people across the border or down from Edmonton and Calgary to, right. to Cardston to see that museum. Right. It will bring people, and we'd have to do the, the studies, to see the museum, and, and this is our really, really our thesis, is that it's a unique uh, subject, a unique thing in the world. What, what we're offering here, or what we have here to, to show the world. Um, but people aren't going to come just to see that museum, uh, and they're not going to stay. They may come just to see the museum, but they won't stay. And that's why we have marketing money for, for the capital project part of it, but beyond that, to make this a success and to build the tourism here, uh, all of your other assets uh, heritage assets and tourism assets, uh, you know, and we have the list of seven or eight others. Right. I think we need to build that into a, a comprehensive, integrated marketing plan that says not only come and see the mammoths right. in Cardston, right. and while you're here, bing, 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 stay overnight and enjoy our restaurants and the Cobblestone Manor and, right. and, and, and. Right. Uh, that's, I think, to my mind, uh, in, in the, the, the bit that I do know about marketing, that big integrated plan will be what will make this whole Cardston Trail concept a success okay. is that people will come and say well there's so much to see in Cardston right. and yeah let's go see the mammoths because because right. that's uh, that's an important part but there's so much else and it's Thank when you. you get people to s come and to stay to stay overnight even if it's one night that's when they spend the money in your town and right. that's when the economic development happens just to jump off of one thing that Shane just said um, how, well you all know, how popular dinosaurs are. Mm -hmm. I mean, kids love dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Always have, since they first uh, mm -hmm. heard about, uh, uh, when I was a kid, when they first heard about the dinosaurs in, in Drumheller. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic that, that is enduring. We're talking not dinosaurs, but certainly a, an extension of that, the Ice Age, and mammoths. I mean, who'd have ever thought? that there were mammoths and camels walking down what's now Main Street Cardston. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it has that same allure and that same staying power as dinosaurs do. That would make a great graphic. I'm going to <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking yeah. maybe we need some mammoths in town somewhere on flags. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Councilor Court, uh, this is just a response to Councilor Brangree's and on the September of their yearly planning strategic meetings. Um, so we got a couple of big projects we've been looking at over the year. 
and perhaps we might just need a special council meeting to sit down and just hash those two big projects out yeah. and really figure out what's going on. That's a great idea. And I would rather wait till Thank September on some of these things. Things happen during the year that pop up that we don't want to have to wait six more months before we decide on them. That's just my yeah. recommendation. We want to have a special council meeting. Well, before you know it, September's going to be here too. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? We need to move on for some more stuff there then? Yeah, and we're just about done here. Okay. Um, um, what's next for Miss Lee? Yeah. Okay. Council decision. And I think you just said, you know, you, you'll, you'll come to that decision as you're able to do that. Uh, as I said, we'd love for you to approve it as quickly as you can and, uh, and as we have presented it. And uh, we're ready to... We're ready to go as soon as we can uh, can do that. Um, and here, these are these are the options. You can approve it as we've presented. You can simply say no, and uh, we'll go back home and put our feet up and uh, uh, not think about mammoths for a while. Um, if the uh, if the answer is yes, then you know we'll we'll have to make a, a contractual agreement there. Um, we would uh, we'd like as part of this, uh, and you'll see it in more detail in your printed material. Um, because you're busy as councillors, we would like to strike a project review committee or, uh, I guess, uh, add a, uh, some, some terms of reference to your Economic Development and Tourism Board um, and have them act as a, as a project review committee. And what, what I mean by that is that um, we don't want to be coming to you every six weeks or every quarter even. You're busy, you've got lots to do. Uh, and uh, we would like a, uh, a broad-based committee of, of people in town, which I gather is, uh, is well represented by your Economic Development Tourism Board. The plan would be for us to have a regular reporting session to them. We'll, we'll come to, to their meetings, uh, tell them what we're, what we're up to, and then they will decide what, how to come and report to you on your regular agendas. So you'll be kept in the loop and the, and the uh, citizens will be kept in the loop of what's happening down at the, at the museum at the new project. So that would be one thing we'd like to set up uh, early on for communications. I think it's a great opportunity to also invite uh, somebody to that review committee representing uh, the Kainai. You know, um, it's uh, having that communication what open would, is quite critical. Uh, um, it really uh, can help us with any ideas that people might have or groups might have about uh, uh, appropriation, cultural appropriation and things like that. So if you've got that representative in place, then, then that's mm -hmm. essential for that. Um, once, once we have uh, you know, a contract in place and ready to go, we'll, we'll start the project. Um, we're missing part of our information here, Shane. Part. Where's the, the opening date? Um, yeah, our technology is not working very well. Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> the date, the date, yeah. Anyway, uh, we start the project, and, and you may ask, why three and a half years? Now, we had projected, and somehow we've lost it here, uh, an opening date. For the museum, we feel that we can hit a, a grand opening party on Labor Day weekend of 2021. Um, <clears throat> now, soft opening, what we mean here is um, that we would open it. We'd like to, we'll, we'll be done enough in there. It should be about ready to go about this time of year of 2021 so we can catch that, that summer audience coming through because the word will have built we will, we will have done the marketing and the talking about it. Uh, I call it a soft opening because uh, in my experience there's always bugs to work out of the system. So we open the doors and we invite people in, uh, but we have the big party uh, uh, in, the, in September because by then we should have it perfect and, uh, and away we go. So that's our, uh, our thought. Um, and I don't want to make anything political, but following that schedule uh, would, meet, would, would encompass this project within your tenure as a council. 
Okay, because that's uh, obviously just before the Good next point, election. Yeah. So. I just want to ask you a question because right now the uh, location of the town is very much in a political realm and in a folk realm at this point with that whole territory around us from the border to here. I think it's absolutely essential that chief and council be on board. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because that has to come first before all decision. Mm -hmm. I agree, totally. Because without that approval, it's, it's a catastrophe in the making. Yes, uh, I agree. Chief and council need to be on board and uh, there needs to be discussions with the county as Wally's Beach is in, in the county uh, and we, we would need to work that out. We're certainly prepared to be your representatives. I mean, this goes beyond uh, the scope of just this project. We're glad to uh, collaborate with you and, and be your agents if that's what you would like us to be, talking with Chief and Council, talking with the county, talking with the province. Uh, we're going to have to have Alberta Transportation involved on the Mammoth Trek uh, well, at south of town. So those kinds of things were fully ready and prepared to uh, I to think a presentation to you. Chief and Council by yourself as the idea, the concept. This is, we've talked it's about so this. It's so important. It's absolutely critical. Critical. And, and, and we get that. And, and if you don't hit them before the end of this month, I can tell you it won't happen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, we'll go out tomorrow. We'll have to talk to them. <laughs> if we can. Yeah. Well, you need to, to give them a you little bit. I mean, they had, they had a council meeting uh, yeah. today, today is Monday, Tuesday. They had a council meeting yesterday. So they normally meet every second Monday. Mm. There's not very much time left. Right. Well, we'll, we'll be right on that. We wanted to get this done, and uh, but that's definitely our... A priority for us because how can you have a gateway project yeah. if you don't have them on board? And Absolutely. I really, the time schedule is so tight right here. Very tight. It is. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not time. possible. Yeah. It just means it's very tight. Yes. And my response would be, we're willing to to work with you to try to in in every way to try to make this work, mm -hmm. if there's any way to make it work. Uh, we're, we're fully negotiable and, and flexible. Yeah. Councilor Bangry. Grant Shane, your proposal <laughs> is excellent. Is there any way that you can start up soft, little, and grow? You know, can you use the present building? You're not going to have 250 people in there on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Can you use the space that you got now and grow from that so that you know, along with that growth comes the funding. Mm -hmm. It would not have the appeal. The, that's the answer. Is yeah. We could put some stuff in there, but we can't put our major draw no. uh, in there to any degree that's going to be different than what you can look up on in the internet. So, yeah. uh, a mammoth. Yeah. Um, that's the difficulty is that what we have uh, is so unique in terms of the, the mammoth trackway and the skeletons and, and remains of the animals, the extinct animals that were found here, uh, even if we just put a part of that in there, uh, we should have we should have shown that picture. It literally would just have to be jammed in. Um, and um, I would be very reluctant to do something less than less than professional and, and something that would not really meet best standards of museology and and uh, and archaeology. Uh, to do that. It would be great if we could, but I don't, we couldn't market it the same way. We couldn't say, come and see this great thing, because we couldn't show them all of the, the great things that, uh, that we have to show them. Um, that was one it's, of the it's first been, uh, we came to. Yeah, uh, and that's a great comment too, because yeah. it's, it has been something we've thought a great deal about. How, you know, can we do it that way? Uh, we had that discussion years ago, uh, talking about it, and and uh, quite frankly, 
um, it's, it will remain just an, uh, just an anomaly. Uh, it, it, I, I can't honestly see any way to grow it. Uh, we could put stuff in the courthouse museum. We consider doing that. Um, uh, there's no room there either. Oh, there's no room. Yeah, there's no room there. Forget that. So, but I still think it's a really great comment. And in many respects, we we think you know as as big as that number is that we've shown you is it's uh, uh, these things can be extraordinarily expensive, especially when they're done on a professional. But we we want to do it professionally, <coughs> otherwise I think we are defeating the purpose of yeah. even I think trying to have a negative It'd be a gopher museum then, eh? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My All right. Is there any other questions before we bring this to a conclusion? <coughs> May I just add one comment to yeah, uh, Mr. Right Chairman? Ahead, um, as far as I am aware, there is no municipality, like a town or a city, in North America that has even considered taking on a project like this. Building a museum, uh, a cultural facility of this magnitude and of this importance by themselves. And uh, uh, I've looked, I've done, done the, the, the research and I wanted to say that I'm, I'm impressed. I, I think this is fabulous that you are even considering this. And I realize it's a lot of money uh, but you will be doing something very unique if you can find a way to do this. Yeah. And you'll read in the materials our philosophy and our approach to it in terms of being professionals and, and uh, being the proponents for this project. Uh, we're prepared to help you in any way, but I just wanted to state that, that this is a very unique thing in Alberta, certainly, in Canada, in North America, and in globally. This will uh, this is kind of the, the jump-off point, I believe, um, where it will attract international attention. And it might take 10 years for us to build yeah. to that point, but uh, Cardston will become a, a, an international focus for the type of thing that we're telling you. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. For, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. For Thank you. Just, just make you're aware, Grant, I, 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 I think you've got a, a council here that's very much in favor of this. We have the logistics we have to talk about yeah. before we can move forward. And there's some things that you have to do. Yeah. Can't reiterate enough talking to the blood tribe. Right. Yeah. If we don't get them on board, it's going to be difficult. Okay? Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. Very, very much. Uh, perhaps at this time we should have a break? Or do we need to maybe uh, adopt the minutes first and then... Okay, let's do that then. Councilor Bangry, have you, have everybody read over the minutes? Any uh, questions on the minutes? Okay, I move to... I'll move, make a motion to accept the minutes and adoption of the minutes of May 1st, uh, 2018. Okay, all in favor? Thank you. I'll entertain a motion for recess. Councilor Court, move to recess. Take 15 minutes, we got some... Please, and we just have a little snack there. A little snack? All right. We did vote on it. No, we didn't. I just, no, I just no. made the motion. No, we didn't. We haven't voted yet. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Oh. All in favor to recess? Yeah. Carried. I like 15.